Welcome to the Sly Gittins Tech Simplified channel. And today I have a fantastic guest. Her name is Marlene Eitzen Shanks. And she is going to share her story how from going from an individual contributor at a company to owning her own staffing company. But I don't want to steal her thunder. Marlene, can you please talk to my audience and share your wonderful story? Thank you, Sly. Oh, it's really fun to be here, and I'm looking forward to this chat with you. Um, you know, it's, I honestly did not set out to be an entrepreneur, never even thought of it, or a business owner, and I certainly had no idea what the staffing industry was. My goal in college, uh, and for seven years after that, was to be a broadcast journalist, and that's what I did. I worked for five CBS News affiliates as a reporter and an anchor, and I was really focused on being successful. You know, um, it was a really good career. But after seven years of, you know, sleeping with a pager on Christmas Eve and that kind of life, I just decided it was time for a change. So my next career step landed me at a national media company in Spokane, Washington. It was owned by the Pulitzer Publishing Company. And we were creating educational programming to go into schools K through 12, delivered by satellite. And believe it or not, this was really novel at the time and cutting edge. Um, and my do job was to be a producer. So the day came where I was asked if I'd like to move to Seattle to manage the Boeing account and the Seattle Public Schools account. And you better believe I was excited to move to Seattle. I've been here ever since. And in that job, I was there about nine years and I grew from producer up to vice president. They sent me around the world. Um, I would go live in different countries and I would do everything from help write a grant with um, a country to help make a TV show. We did one program, it was with American Express, British Airways, Boeing and Microsoft as the sponsors with Beijing television. It was like a game show, talk show combination. And there I was not understanding any Mandarin, but I learned how to read body language, right? And I was the person to make sure it all happened, right? So all these crazy skills and who knew all those skills, you know, account management, business development, communication, um, would all come in handy in my career as an entrepreneur. Yeah, that was, that's a fantastic story. And um, can you like, Tell us, how did it feel when you was in, you know, in that, in that meeting and you can't understand the language, but you got to look at body language. What was going through your mind there? Like, it's, I'm just curious to understand that. You know, I was working with a director um, who was, um, you know, a young, young man. And he, um, he, one day I, there was a take and I didn't, I, he didn't like what had just happened on the stage, mm -hmm. on the set. And I could tell he was throwing me under the bus saying that I didn't like it in Chinese, right? He was telling them that I didn't like it and I liked it. I thought it was fine. So I called him on it. He was bilingual. And he said, how did you know I was doing that? And I said, because I can tell. <laughs> and it was just the funniest thing. He looked at me one day and he said, you have the skill. You could make a lot of money in China as a mind reader or whatever he thought I was doing. But you just adapt, right? You just adapt. And once you've been through an experience like that, you go, oh, I, that was a nice skill to pick up for the rest of my life, right? I guess that, that goes into the next question. What would you have told yourself earlier in your career with the knowledge that you attained along your career? What would you have told yourself when you was fresh out of school? Hmm. Oh, gosh, is in hindsight just the best? Um, you know, for me, you know, and my path has zigged and zagged a bit, right? So it's really okay um, for the path not to be straight, right? Um, you don't have to be afraid if you, you know, try something and then try something else. You know, a lot of people, you know, sure, they go get their undergrad degree and then they go get their master's degree and then they get their first job at a top 100 company, right? But not everybody's like that. And our, not every path is like that, right? And, and I think it's actually richer 
if you've broken out of some of those boxes, tried different things, and then you bring those experiences with you to your career. I think it can make for a richer, more professional person in the future. But I'm a little biased, maybe. Um, also, I think, look at every experience as valuable, right? You know, who knew when I was, when I was you know, traveling around Asia and, and account managing, you know, folks, you know, in different countries that, that that would work for me later. That would be a wonderful experience to have as a business owner, you know, and now of course, half of my candidates are from different countries. And, you know, I'm so thankful that I've actually been in their culture and, and I have that, you know, just that wonderful background, right? Um, and I also like to tell people, you know, don't judge yourself by other people's version of success, you know, especially with social media and, you know, you're looking at everybody on LinkedIn and everyone looks so amazing and got their self together and, you know, you don't know the whole story. And I've got to tell you, you know, I've, I've hung out with senators and congressmen in my journalist days and in my professional days, you know, you know, general managers and vice presidents. And, you know, there, a lot of people are, are are, are happy and, and have balanced lives, but it is a sad truth. I know a lot of professionals, very successful people who don't have lives that I would want. And if you just look at people on social media and you compare yourself, you know, it's just, I don't think it's helpful at all, honestly. Yeah. And I think what you just touched upon is something that the audience need to hear. Cause I tend to have between 18 to 35 is the age range who's tunes into my videos. And I think, as you know, it's pretty predominant now with social media and, and social media influencers, and especially with COVID, is we're not in um, face-to-face -face interactions anymore. Everything is online. So people are spending more time. And, you know, I see people like, oh, Sly, well, how did you get here, right? But then when you tell them the story, it took some time to get there. I'm like, well, I see you doing this now. How can I get there tomorrow? And sometimes yeah. I think what you said is something I think is really key as tweetable is you got to respect the journey. You mm -hmm. got to enjoy the journey and understand that your story is unique mm -hmm. and that's okay. Right. You know, so I think that, that was, that was a very good, uh, um, that's some great information that you've just provided there. So I got another question for you. So you had a lot of great opportunities. You got to travel the world. You're now an owner. It seems like, did you run into any obstacles along the way that you thought, mm -hmm you probably wouldn't be over to overcome to get you where you are today? Yeah. You know, obstacles are funny because I'm one of those people, I, I don't think about obstacles a lot because I actually enjoy challenges, right? And I enjoy, you know, just having to figure things out, how to get around things, right? Mm -hmm. But I am reminded occasionally, and I'm shocked every time I'm reminded of this, but I believe women in business have some unique challenges, Right. Um, you know, as a news reporter, I remember many times I'd be carrying, you know, my hundred pounds of camera gear um, up to, for example, a plane crash. And I remember looking around and I was the only woman there, right? And that was a common occurrence. Um, and today as a business owner, you know, the statistics are improving for women, but still, for example, just 1% of all women owned businesses have companies with a gross revenue of over a million dollars. Um, I feel very fortunate that Team Red Dog is in that 1% and has been for many years, but I'm very aware that there are obstacles for women who want to do the same. And that issues including less access to capital, um, more limited professional networks, and the demands of balancing work and family, you know, during COVID and beyond, you know, are real. And that's, and that's a very great statement you said, right? And that's one of the reasons why I even created this channel is how do you ampli amplify these, you know, amazing women, right? Like I knew so many and I'm like, man, I got to give them a platform. Like they didn't need it for me. I actually did it for my daughter. I think I told you in, in the, when I requested you to be on the show, right? Because I want her the opportunity to know that these things are possible. They might be challenging because as an African-American man, I can you know, empathize for that, right? Like as an engineer, I don't see at, at that many African-American males. They are some, um, same thing for business owners again, right? Um, so I could definitely, I could definitely empathize on that. And um, that can be tough, right? Cause sometimes you feel like people don't understand what you're going through at that point. And at times it's tough to go on, right? 
you might mm-hmm. not be saying these things, but we could be feeling those things. So yeah. definitely, you know, I had to put together some strategies on how do you keep the fire burning? Cause I've always been a person that, well, my parents instilled in me, right? Mm-hmm. You keep moving forward, right? You yeah. keep being the best version of yourself. You always find a way to f- provide value and you'll never have to struggle for anything, right? So, you know, so I always yeah. push that, right? Uh, but it's yeah. tough sometimes. Definitely get tough to persevere yeah. on that. So is, do you have any, like, mantras? What are you doing to keep your mind right mentally? To keep my mind right mentally. You know, I guess I've always, even when I was working for another company, for other companies, um, no matter what the role and what my job, I've always seen myself kind of as my own boss. Um, and that doesn't mean I wasn't a good employee and all that, but I've just always kind of seen myself as, mm, I guess, a hired gun in a positive way, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that mentality has helped me, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, it definitely helps you if you want to start your own business or your own company, right? Um, yeah. And I think that's, 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 that's great that you say that is because um, at least from my, my background, I'm always thinking of, you know, creating projects, right, to challenge myself. Like if I ever got bored in a job, I find things to do that I want to grow on. Like I define where I want to grow at and then I, you know, force myself to get in that because no one told me to start a YouTube channel. No one told me to learn all these things or how to outreach or how to have these conversations. I proactively, you know, either A, learn or talk to people who can help me um, further my career or I could help them also, right? But put me in certain situations to grow a little bit faster. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I I think you're right. If you got to take full control of your life um, because A, either someone's going to limit you in terms of putting you in a box. Mm -hmm. B, you might get overlooked for things that you know that you have the capability. And C, you just want to make sure that you only get one time, you know, to live life. And I know that's cliche, but mm-hmm. it's so true. So are you using your time for the right things? So, that's right. I agree. I always tell people, listen, if that opportunity is right in front of you, like, for example, how did someone like me, you know, journalism major, German major, how did I get into IT? How did I become how did I create a company where we're supporting IT? I wasn't, you know, I wasn't getting a technical degree in school, right? Um and, but it was there. And, you know, there was a point where I knew it was time to leverage what I'd learned in the media world um, and to pivot that experience to a new career. And it was pretty hard not to point at IT as the next big industry, right? Um, I was actually interviewing for a full time role at Microsoft Studios, uh, the media arm of Microsoft. And I looked around and I saw these really happy, cool looking people, and I found out they were vendors. And I had never thought of being a contractor um, as a career option in the past, but it suddenly looked really fun and, and freeing after being, you know, in corporate America for so many years, right? And then once I was inside Microsoft, you know, there really was no turning back. I really wanted to transition from media to marketing. Mm-hmm. So I focused on landing some big marketing, on some big marketing teams, and I ended up being the launch manager as a contractor for a few versions of SQL Server, which was the best experience, right? Mm-hmm. And then during that time, you know, the opportunity was there to start my own staffing company, right? Focused on providing um, contingent staffing for tech-focused companies. And so around that time, I decided, okay, I'm going, going to take this opportunity. I'm going to stop working myself as a contractor so I can grow my business, right? So focus 100% on that. And then we expanded when other opportunities came along into not just servicing tech focused companies, but, you know, other industries as well. And we now provide staffing for both contract and full-time placements, you know, for software IT and cloud services, analytics and business management and marketing and creative. So I feel like math would never have happened if I'd had the attitude of not taking not taking opportunities as they came along. And they weren't always the opportunity that I thought I was going to want, you know, but I didn't say no very often, if that makes sense. Yeah, and, that, and that's powerful um, because I think sometimes um, what I've been seeing by like talking to a lot of people is um, they talk themselves out of opportunities. Mm-hmm. So I got presented to switch from a sales engineer 
to uh, technical product marketing manager. Mm-hmm. Even though I went to school for marketing, but I was like eight years before. Mm-hmm. That's exactly what I wanted to do, but I like, let me take this chance. And it was the best thing I ever did. I got to learn how it feels to be on the marketing side from the sales side and the engineering side. And that's a different mindset mm-hmm. that led me into a director role. Found out what I liked and what I didn't like there again, but those experience helped me be even a better like sales engineer now because of the decision makers from a manager's perspective, from a marketing perspective, I'm working with those teams a lot better. And you're right. Or even the skills from marketing, I apply it right now, right? I know how to create different personas when I'm talking to them, how to build target market and target audience. So I can actually, you know, reach out to owners, right? Because I know some of the things that they're looking to look for now, right? So yeah, you're right. That's, that's pretty powerful. And that kind of goes into our next question is, since you are staffing agent, you look in that interviewing from a, a macro level, right? Because mm-hmm. you're seeing so many things. So I guess my question for um, the audience out there, because a lot of them are, they lost their job due to COVID. Mm-hmm. So how do they separate themselves or better yet, how do they brand themselves effectively online to stick out from the competition? Mm. How to brand online so you stick out. You know, um, you know, there's a lot of, it depends on the role, really. If you're a marketing person, you better have some good portfolios, right? Um, if you're a developer, you better have some code, right? I mean, there's just different things that you want to have prepared. But my top interview tips that I like to pass on to candidates, you know, I've got several things I, I really believe in. One is, um, you know, be prepared to review all the qualifications from a job description with clear scenarios. I can't believe how many times I've been talking to people and they didn't go through each deliverable in the job description and then come up with a scenario about how they have, you know, tackled that in the past, right? Um, I think the STAR method's really great, you know, um, where you're coming up with a situation, a task, an action, and a result. Um, And we've actually got a blog um, on our website with lots of STAR tips and and lots of interview tips, by the way. So um, anyone's welcome to go to teamreddog.com and check those out. Um, But, you know, practice, right? We sit down with people before interviews and we practice because I think that's the hardest part. and it is hard it is hard to attract people to get the interview but i think once you get that interview it's equally as difficult to ace that thing right um and i think it takes practice right and make sure your answers are succinct and make sure you've also got the not make sure you've also got the deeper level answer if they want it but ask them right don't talk for longer than 30 seconds and then say would you like to hear more right and have that scenario ready, have that, you know, this was my situation, the task, the action I took and the results, right? Um, because people, they're trying to tell if you, what your behavior was like in past roles to see what you're going to be like in the future. They have a right to okay. do that. Yeah. May as well roll with it, right? May as well ace that, right? You control the story because you've practiced it, right? And you've thought through it, right? Um, those are my big ones. And then honestly, right now, this day and age, um, I can't believe how many candidates we speak with who have cruddy audio, right? Hopefully mine's okay today, but you know, like they're on their cell phone yeah. and, and they're breaking up all the time. And last, just last week I had a panel come back to us and say, Hey, we we want her third interview but we were having trouble hearing her. She was breaking up a lot. And I'm thinking, Oh God, that's just what you, you know, it's hard enough. It's hard enough, right? You're trying to sell yourself and you don't want any of your precious words to get lost because you have cruddy, cruddy technology, right? So check it out with someone go do mock interviews before you go interview is what I'm trying to say. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and make sure your technology is good. Make sure your computer audio and your, and your, you know, whatever you're using is, is going to rock it for you. Right. It's really important. Question for you then. Do are, are people still dressing up? for an interview on the phone? I mean, like a Zoom interview or a Teams interview or just a video conference in general? They are. And, you know, it doesn't have to be, you know, cat's pajamas, you know, but you want to be, you know, dress dress up more than the people who are interviewing you, right? Okay. Um, Absolutely. It tells everyone that you care 
and that you can be professional. They may never see you in that outfit ever again. You may wear a t-shirt for the, from until eternity once you start your job, but they know that you cared enough and that you can be professional. Absolutely. Okay. And yeah. then the next one is negotiation tips. Because uh, um, one thing I want to do is the stigma that a lot of women are not good negotiators. And I like to counteract that because I know a lot of women who can uh, negotiate <laughs> better than most people I know. So um, <laughs> what tips would you give them? Um, universal tips or mm-hmm. um, just, or also give us some tips and some 100% don'ts, right? Like what, what would you should not suggest someone not to do? Yeah, I've, I've, uh, I've got one for you that I feel you would once when people know me and they know I'm really nice and I think my friends would be a little shocked that I'm saying this, but um, don't be afraid to walk away if you believe strongly in what you're asking for. Um, and I'm saying this because I experienced this at a time when I was, um, you know, in my late twenties and I was, you know, a senior director working for a company and, you know, they needed some new business. They were, they really needed some, some more um, clients in the company at this certain time. And So I just decided to get out of my box and put on the business development hat. And I found a, you know, multi-million dollar grant. I cold called the prospective partner. Um, We worked together. We won the grant and it resulted in three years worth of business for the company I worked for. Well, yay. Right. And I looked around at that time and I thought, okay, I've been asking for, for a promotion to be vice president what I do in my job is commiserate with that title. I thought, you know, if there's ever a time to ask again, it would be now, right? There were also no women vice presidents in the company. And I was pretty sure that they were really happy with that situation. (laughs) So what, so my messaging had to be pretty direct and it was basically that I would be happy to remain at the company in a new vice president role to manage the new client and make sure that the relationship remained successful if I was a vice president, right? And so shortly after that, I was promoted to vice president. Um, I haven't, you know, I think what, what worked there was realizing when you have leverage, right? And when you truly, not just leverage, but I deserved that. I went and found the money. It wasn't even my job. I brought it in. And like, really, you're not going to let me have the promotion that I've been asking for, right? Um, So, you know, I I just like to tell people to, um, you know, know what you're worth. And if you're not afraid to walk away, yes, sometimes you might lose, lose out. But then, you know, you've got the integrity of knowing that you didn't sell out. Um, but also sometimes it's just a great job. So sometimes, sometimes you can just get the good title um, and they're not going to, they can't pay you, right? Especially if it's a smaller company. For a smaller company, you're going to go in and you're going to think, okay, they can't pay me probably as much as a midsize or an enterprise level company, but they can give me the title. They can give me a better title, right? So sometimes you're not negotiating for salary. You're negotiating for title, right? And it's just as valuable. True. And I, I thank you. I'm not thanking them. I agree with that a lot because when I went to a startup, I was able to become a director and then that directly influenced my next paycheck, right? Even though I'm not a director at a larger company, mm-hmm. but I still get paid on par what probably a director at a smaller company would make, mm-hmm. right? So you're right. You got to know what you're worth. Like uh, mm-hmm. I've walked away from jobs when I, I know from the certifications and what I've done. Um, and also the following I made online that I know if I start promoting for the company that I can drive attendance, I can drive interest, you know, so, and I've done it in the past. So you're right, knowing your worth and yeah. also understanding your, like you say, your walk away point, right? Mm-hmm. Because sometimes, mm-hmm. you know, and you also got to know what you want to do because sometimes you might get a job that you just don't love and the money might be there, but mm-hmm. it, might, it might not be the right fit for you too. So Exactly. Right. Well, that's, that's, that's some great information. So let's start winding down the actual um, interview. And would you share some of your favorite books um, personally that you enjoy to read and also maybe some interviews books or ne- negotiation books, if you have any. Hmm. Oh, I don't know about the negotiation books, but um, 
I do like, um, you know, I'm, I'm just one of those people, right? I think that comes with being a journalist, but I just, I have a really broad a, a variety of things that I really like, right? So sometimes I'm reading about farming or I'm reading about, you know, uh, riding horses or, you know, I've been um, re reading and listening to Michelle Obama's Becoming, right? I love that book and I love it in her voice on audiobooks because she is the best voice in the whole world, right? And I love her story. I just love her story, right? Um, I've also been reading a book called Traction. Uh, it's by Gina Wickman, and it helps support a program that we rolled out inside our company called EOS. It's an entrepreneurial operating system. Sounds a little boring, but this thing, we, we self, um, we brought it in ourselves. We didn't um, have a consultant help us. Um, and we I love it, right? And so I've been reading a book called Traction, which um, helps explain how to use it. You know, it affects everything in your company from how people write their own, how you write job descriptions for your team to um, rules for having a meeting, um, how to put issues over here and your to-do list over here and how to just keep things really streamlined and organized. So I love EOS. So I've been reading um, that book again lately. And then recent podcasts, um, you know, the TED Radio Hour, um, in, 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 <laughs> Invisibilia, I never can say that. And there's even this kind of funky um, UK podcast called No Country for Young Women, which focuses on women of color, and they all have that British accent. And, you know, it's kind of fun. Um, so you can see I, I'm like, you know, and then I read historical fiction, and I've never been one of these people who only reads, um, you know, self-help or professional growth books, right? I like to mix it up. I'm a mom too, right? So that's my escape sometimes too. Um, but I noticed when I was younger in my, you know, 20s and 30s, I definitely read more self-help. And I think as you get older, you know, you've kind of figured a few more things out, um, but you still go to the books, right? You still go to the books and the podcasts because we have, and we've never had so much information at our fingertips, right? Oh, yeah. So many amazing people to learn from and grow from. It's exciting. Oh yeah. And I think it's no more excuses, right? So you can no. pretty much find whatever you want on there, right? From anything. Like I wanted to start how to learn how to do video production. Mm -hmm. YouTube, I found LinkedIn learning sites. I found all these different areas that I can reach out to or people I can reach out to learn. Um, for negotiation books, Crucial Conversation, Never Split the Difference is a good one. Getting the Yes is another good one. Um, so those, um, even in one book, I also like, I teach you how to be rich. It's mm -hmm. a little yeah. bit more when you fresh out of college book that I like. Uh, yeah. taught me how to use my 401k, but it taught me also how to negotiate for my car. Like very simple, trivial task that it, it, it talks about, but it's very helpful if you didn't know that, right? To set the foundation. Yeah. Uh, but you're right. Like I read a lot of poetry, like Langston Hughes. Mm -hmm. um, I write poetry. Mm -hmm. um, I might read about um, being a dad or, you know, development for a child because my, my daughter is only 17 months, mm -hmm. right? So like different things on that or, um, something I like to read about, like my family's from Barbados. So I like to read about history from there, right? So yeah. like different pieces I'm pulling from. I'm in marketing. I also like tech. So I'm blending the both of them, you know. Um, and, you know, I, and I love, like I think I told you before, real estate. So I, I read a ton about that. But what I find is I find similarities of the people who are successful in those areas. Yeah. Look at the qu the qualities are very similar in terms mm -hmm. of their time management, their focus, and mm -hmm. you realize that they're pretty much like, like I coined the tag always be learning mm -hmm. is because most people I'm talking about, they're learning in multiple disciplines, right? Yeah. Um, they might specialize in the area, but they do go outside to either be more cultured or more yeah. aware in another subject matter. I think so. I think that's imperative. You don't have to do that because I can tell you now, I primarily read self-help books, mm -hmm. and but you know, I'm 32. Right. So that makes sense. In my 20s, it helped me a lot to get where I am now. And mm -hmm. now I'm shifting more into a lot of poetry. I like a lot of arts. This is my background. Right. So, um, yeah. And I think a lot of people really like even just uh, being in groups. Right. So I used to be in an investment club. Right. And we just had so much fun. Right. We just had so much fun. And I learned about investing by being in this little club every month we'd meet. Right. Mm -hmm. and it's like a reading club, but it's an investment club. Or I'm in a women president's group right 
And I learn so much from these other ladies who do the same thing I do, have different kinds of companies, but we're all in the same role, right? So those yeah. like meetups and all the, uh, all the chances these days, all the opportunities to join like-minded people and be part of something bigger than yourself. I find that I learned so much that way too, right? Yeah, that's true. Like I, I started joining different tech meetups or Facebook groups that are all like engineering for cloud engineering. And uh, it helps me learn what I don't know, right? Or meet other people who think of a same problem in different ways. Or for poetry, I used to do open mic nights and I would go to different po poetry um, sessions to hear other poets and how to articulate words. Because for me, I like to take some of that host MC vibes and bring it into the tech space because sometimes when you're hearing technical training, it's very dry. It's, they know their stuff, but they don't know how to convey it in a way that is entertaining that will maintain someone's attention. And yeah. in poetry, you got to be able to do that to convince your audience, you know, oh, not even convince, just showcase your talents and make them maintain it and follow you, right? So, absolutely. Um, yeah, you're right, man. And I, I remember I started uh, the cybersecurity meetup group when I was in Tampa. And I got to meet one of my good friends from there who owns his own company. So he would tell me certain things where I could help in my current roles or if I ever want to go out there. Like you learn experiences because people are a little bit more open when they're in these groups because you're not at work. You don't have to follow any rules. You just can be open and be free and talk about a similar topic. So yeah, I know yeah. We, we had a fantastic conversation. I hope the audience enjoyed it but it must come to an end. But before it does, Marlene, how can my audience contact you to keep this conversation going and start a relationship with you? Absolutely. Um, I'm on LinkedIn. Love to talk to people. Um, we are at uh, teamreddog.com and I can also be reached at uh, Marlene at teamreddog.com. So would love to chat with anyone, answer questions. Happy to do that. Yep, and I'll gather those links from her and make sure to put it in the description so you don't even have to hit that rewind button. Just look down to the bottom. Or if you listen to this as a podcast, take a look at the show notes or just go all right over to the YouTube page. So without any further ado, Sly Gittins and Marlene is out. Peace. <laughs>